I'm a feminist, but this week I am on the front cover of Stylist magazine. <laughs> and they won't show you the front cover before it goes out. Oh, someone's just held it up. Oh, brilliant. I haven't seen one in the reel. All right, Thank teacher's you. pet. What? <laughs> I saw it too. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Did anyone bring me one, though? Because they said they'd send me one, but I haven't been on the tube today, so I haven't got one. So, oh, see, I feel that dress. What? You were Spartacus. Well, um, what? I'm stylist. Did I am stylist. This is brilliant. So many people have got their stylist. Don't look proud of yourself. It's I free. Feel... <laughs> it's like, what? Nothing. It's, look, you look great. What were you going to say? <laughs> Why would you say that? Don't have to find it. They said to me, I said, can I just see the cover so I can get it into my head? Because I'm quite good at, you know, having a friend go, yeah, no, it looks great. And then talking myself into a good place with it. But if I just see it on the newsstand, I'm going to kind of get it in my head. And they were like, no, not even Oprah got to see her front cover. Not even Michelle Obama gets to see her front cover. Nobody gets to see the front cover. So I was like, okay, okay, okay. But then they sent, because I wrote the article, they sent me the inside so I could see the ones inside. And I did think, these could be Photoshop more. <laughs> Just a bit more. I was just expecting a bit more Photoshop. But I thought, I'm a feminist. Can I ask for more Photoshop? Because you always hear the stories of Kate Winslet saying, and I demanded they unphotoshop me. And I'm thinking, well, that's all right for you, Kate Winslet. That's lovely for you. What great PR for you and your flawless skin and legs. But what the fuck? So I was like, how do I word this? So I just emailed, dropped them a quick email did, saying, Love, lovely, lovely, so lovely, so pleased, so, oh, pleased, and don't, I love. <laughs> so I did the really nice photos, and the photographer did a brilliant job. I mean, mm. I don't get me wrong, the job is brilliantly done, beautifully. The stylist, the makeup, the, you know, they do, they make you look really good, and, you know, all of that. But just wondering, is that all the Photoshop you're going to do, <laughs> or is there more? <laughs> just inquiring. Yeah. Totally chill. Hashtag feminism. <laughs> Hashtag feminism. And she wrote back and went, oh no, we haven't touched the photos up at all. And you I, were like, I'm a fucking babe. I was so relieved and thrilled and happy that they had not been touched up. I couldn't have been more excited than if I hadn't been touched up on the tube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, but based purely on track record... I don't think that women should be prime minister. <laughs> and based purely on a record, do you think men should be? Oh, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. Because <laughs> David Cameron did a bang up job. Yeah, 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 yeah. For he, sure, for sure. He's for sure. my favorite. He's no, gotta absolutely. Be, he's got to be in my top. Ten Hang on a second. Favorite dish Is this bags. not the part where we make jokes? You yeah, don't get to take me literally. I was no, like... <laughs> no, no, I just can't help taking yeah, no, that's it. I, if I saw an opportunity to go for David Cameron and I couldn't yeah. stop myself. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but when they told me I hadn't been touched up at Stylist, <laughs> I'd held onto the photographer's card for a long time because he'd given it to me at the end. And I wrote to him and just said, I've just seen the photos, brilliant, beautiful, brilliant, so nice, so lovely, so lovely. I mean... <laughs> We should do a photo shoot together. So lovely. I heard they haven't been touched up. And I just want to say, you might think I'm a feminist, so I don't want them touched up. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like I would love it if no one got photoshopped. But as everyone else is getting photoshopped, <laughs> for the sake of equality... And you could argue feminism. Yes. Because it's got to be an even playing field. I would advocate we all stop photoshopping, but we're not going to this week. So yeah. I said, feel free to photoshop me as if I'm not a feminist. And he wrote back and said, when I'm finished with you, you'll just be a pair of cheekbones in a dress. <laughs> and I was so pleased. I was reassured by his words. There's a lot to unpack there, Deborah. Um, first of all, when you said, feel free to retouch me like I'm not a feminist. It's some words to that effect. I don't know if I actually said, as if I'm not a feminist. That I that just was assumed he'd send you back with no clothes on. Like, I just oh, assumed he just managed to take it all. No, but no. just cheekbones. No, but also feminists can 
pose naked, as is their right. Yeah, sure. I just it's their was body. assuming male gaze. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Okay, God, we really can talk ourselves in and out of a lot of nonsense, can't we? <laughs> Shall I have one? Shall I? Do? That's great. And so you're happy with the outcome? Yeah. Yeah, great. Great, yeah. great, great. great. No, I'm, 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 I'm delighted. All right, great. I'm a feminist, but my abiding takeaway from the favourite a story about three very complex characters is how hot Rachel Weiss looked in every scene she was holding a gun for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very good story and very important that we're telling women's history, but also, fucking hell. (laughs) Who knew? Her is a soft butch. Jesus. (laughs) Yeah, that's the one I really feel. Um... I'm a feminist, but earlier today I said I'm as surprised as you that I'm a cover girl on Instagram. And I realised at the time I probably should have said cover woman, but I wanted to sound hot and sexy. And a cover woman sounds like someone who's paid to cover lawn furniture (laughs) just before it rains. I wanted to sound youthful and glowing. Interesting that that's the unfeminist bit you thought. I thought it was the bit where you said you were surprised. Well, you can't say on Instagram, I'm, as, <laughs> yeah, as expected, <laughs> as fully expected, predicted at my birth by one of the elves, by one of the fairies, cover girl. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'm a feminist, but I am also a member of a Facebook group that shames people's engagement rings. <laughs> do better than that that is the that is we have to stop playing this game now for good because that is wow it's called um that's it i'm ring shaming that's Uh, it i'm ring shaming yeah it's very on the nose there's never something that you do where you think it would be better to say oh i thought it was porn um but in this case it might have been better um yeah it's very funny the ring shaming porn site is not one i'd be happy to visit (laughs) Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Catherine Bohart, and very special guests Laura Wade and Catherine Parkinson talking about domesticity. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Um, so today we're talking about domesticity. Yes, which is a word I'm still not sure I'm saying right, but great. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like the origins and the idea of domesticity, very, very interesting. And I can't wait to get into it. Are you, would you say you're basically a domestic creature? Do you like to order your home and to uh, nest in your home? And do you like to look after your home? Yes, all of the above. Also, clinically diagnosed with OCD. So, which one's my personality? Which one's the mental illness? Um, I would say, <laughs> And yes. which one is the demands of the patriarchy? Well, yes, indeed. I'm not um, free of them. Nonetheless, I do live in a queer home. So, the degree to which patriarchy informs my domesticity is limited. Do you, by queer home, though, do you mean a sort of zone six sort of bed sit? <laughs> sort of something above a church conversion? I mean, the bedrooms are downstairs. It's my, right. no. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, oh, I mean, we're in London, so you do need to specify. Oh, sorry, I forgot where we are. Um, no, I mean that I live with my girlfriend. Right. And so uh, the degree... You're in a same-sex relationship. And does that affect... The Such an unsexy way of saying it. Yeah, sorry, we are. S- sorry. No, no, it's not your fault. Sorry. That's the term. I- it's just what. No, no, I... Uh, uh, yes. Same-sex relationship. Same... It just always comes out of the... Like, you just know... Yeah, I don't mean it sort of sounds like, oh, same-sex, different day. Yeah. <laughs> but also, like... <laughs> I, I mean, I... I've just been married a long-term relationship. I've been married a long time to a man, but I would also call it a same-sex yeah. relationship. Because there's, yeah. there's only so many ways you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And you find a routine... You I know. find a routine. Also, who has more than five moves? It's like, obviously. I mean, although I feel like it's easier for straight couples because straight couples have at least ten moves, right? If he has five moves and you have five moves. Well, we just have to play the same movie back to back. 
Are you talking? Is this the sort of difference between backgammon and chess? <laughs> no, this is the section of the show that will get me in trouble with my girlfriend. Um, she's not here. She's not. No, sh- I mean, I shouldn't is- shout that so gleefully. <laughs> she's not. Oh. Um, um, the question was, do I? Am I a nester? Yes, mm. I am. I am very aesthetic about my and like quite house proud. Great. So tonight we're going to analyse how that affects feminism and us as women creatures in the world. Great. Um, and do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I probably I like... can't say women creatures because it was. I'm, I don't know. People get let's... mad about everything you say, Deborah. You might as well say it. Not no. the policy. Okay. After Good. that, whole, after <laughs> this room was like, no, after that's not that the whole problem. bleed us row on Twitter. I'm just going to say women and non-binary people. Yes, fine. I'm um, a bit of a mouthful, but fine. <laughs> Same-sex relationship. I was going to say the lesbian complaint. Go on. Um, Are you ready for some more stand-up comedy? Yeah. It's only dead with Francis White. Yeah. Hello, 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 and welcome. Thank you so much for coming out. Give us a cheer if you listen to The Guilty Feminist. A cheer if you don't know what you're at. Okay. Some people who seem less enlightened, less happy, less sure of their direction in life. So thank you so much for coming out. Uh, this is a show about our noble goals as feminists and our hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine those goals. Um, uh, just give us a cheer if you're wearing a feminist t-shirt tonight or other feminist paraphernalia with you. This that's, doesn't sound as enthusiastic as it could. Anyone just wave if you've got a feminist t-shirt on? Have you got a feminist t-shirt on? No, it's just a t-shirt. It says, forget me not. And it's got... It's basically love me, love me not. It's the opposite of a feminist t-shirt. <laughs> but you're sitting in the second row. Is that a t-shirt that says, I love boys, why don't they love me? This is... It's good. You've come to learn. This is why we call it the guilty feminist, not the guilt feminist who's completed the full set. Absolutely. Any other feminist t-shirts? Is that it? Normally there's loads. Everyone comes wearing them. This is a January audience. We haven't got going yet. The feminist t-shirts are still at the bottom of the washing pile. Don't know what I'm barely here. I don't know where I am. My body hasn't woken up. What is this anyway? It's sold out tonight. At least you've got here. The two people who bought row A9 and 10, they're still at the bottom of the washing pile with the feminist t-shirts, my friends. Uh, we are sold out, but there's seats here, so if people come in late, just tut in the old-school, time-honoured tradition of British feminists. It's how we got the vote. People think it was violence, but ultimately, I think the tutting outweighed the violence. In any British ratio, tutting will outweigh violence. A good eye roll in the direction of a Prime Minister is certainly what we need now. <laughs> Holy fuck, have you seen the news? Does anyone understand the news? What's going on? And then, did you see last night when it was all kind of... It was like 482 no's and three yays. Um, it was stats that the Gillette people would have been very happy with on YouTube, to be honest. So that's, that's upsetting. We'll probably talk about that tonight. Um, yeah, and then, then Boris Johnson was on, going, oh, well, I mean, I think well, what we need to do and what Theresa May need to do... I'm like, Boris Johnson? Why is he being for his advice. It's like turning up to the scene of a drunk driving incident and asking the drunk driver who caused the accident to drive the tow truck. <laughs> he isn't good at his job. He isn't good at anyone's job. He couldn't do your job. What? The, why do they keep being asked? He just looks like the type who might be able to do things in our imaginations because we've seen too many films. And the people who are allowed to do things look tall and white and posh. It's the only explanation. When are, when are tall white posh men going to have a collective crisis of confidence? When are they going to look around and go, we've been running things for 10,000 years and it's all fucked? Do you, do you think it's us? No! They keep replacing themselves with another one of them! With another one of them. At most, they'll let a posh white woman have a go, but not for long, and only when she can't get it right. <laughs> only when there's no hope of them getting it right. They're like, let a woman one have a go, then we won't have to have another woman one for 80 years. 
That's what they've done. That's what they've done. I mean, I'm not defending her. She is basically Cruella de Vil meets the Wicked Witch of the West and would personally escort back two-year-old refugees across the channel in a rowboat she rowed rather than let them stay a night and have a warm bed. Oh, no, she's a terrible, terrible person. Don't get me wrong. But this is an undoable job given to a terrible cunt. So it's... <laughs> that's not OK, is it? I can't say... I'm, that's, I'm a feminist, but no, you shouldn't. I just... I, do you know what? I was like a horse coming up to a jump. And I thought, don't go for that. That's not... Just came into my head. And I thought, don't do that. <gasps> it's the... Oh! It's the Aro! It's the Aro gang. It's the Aro. Are you wearing any feminist paraphernalia? We thought you might be. We're not, sorry. You are because you're wearing a denim boiler suit. <laughs> and nothing says we can do it like a denim boiler suit. Shit. It's basically Rosie the Riveter. Look, do you, do you mind standing up and showing them? But you have to do the, put the scarf on and then you have to put the scarf around so they get it. And can you do the sort of, yeah, do the, you'll see. It is actually Rosie the Riveter. Go on. Yes. That, that wasn't as Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter does that, not that. That's Liberace. Yes, yeah. It's more like that. We could do it, yeah. Absolutely. You could have done the Second World War on your own, I reckon. And won it. Or come a close second. Um, so domesticity was started where the home was invented. We were 10 million years on the savannah, and we've only been 10,000 years here at The Guilty Feminist. So it's a long time to have got good at savannah living. And there, we know from hunter-gatherer tribes that are uninterrupted up to this day, uh, women could gather as much as men could hunt. And there was no sense of the women having to look after the children. Childcare is completely shared. Both are wealth creators. Sometimes women hunt, sometimes men gather. And uh, the idea of women being in the home and women looking after the children happened with the invention of the plough. The plough really fucked us over. <laughs> sometimes I'm still a little bitter about it, to be honest with you. <laughs> Because when we invented the plough, that meant we could stop. We didn't have to be nomadic. And if you can stop, uh, then you can create a shelter. And if you can create a shelter, you might as well, you know, kind of be in it. And then uh, because the plough required a lot of upper body strength at first, and we were always too pregnant to plough. <laughs> so uh, that's how come men got ploughing and wealth creation. And then women might as well be in the shelter. And then if you've got children who might get in the way of the plough, rather than teaching them to plough, they can just stay inside with the woman. That's how it happened. That's how domesticity happened. And it was at this point uh, that things became popular. I mean, I love my standard lamps and my scatter cushions, but I don't want them at an airport. Any luggage you have to carry at an airport is a burden, right? If you had to carry everything in your house around an airport, you would marry condo that shit <laughs> down to what you can fit in one suitcase. So when we were nomadic, we didn't want a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff was a burden. But as soon as you've got a house, of course you can put stuff in the house. So anybody who's creating wealth, i.e. ploughing, owns the house and is breathing into the house. Anything inside the house is a possession. And that's when women and children became possessions. And that's why women couldn't inherit property. Because they were property. You can't, to this day, in your will, leave your house to your car. <laughs> That's why men couldn't leave their houses to their wives. Property. Do you see what I'm saying? So I always thought, well, that's the beginning of domesticity, the beginning of the home, that kind of makes sense. But this week, in my research, I learned about the cult of domesticity, which was invented in the 1800s, which I'm going to share with you now. The cult of domesticity or the cult of true womanhood, is a term by, used by historians to describe what they consider to have been a prevailing value system among the upper and middle classes during the 19th century in the United States and the United Kingdom. When have posh people in the United States and the United Kingdom ever ruined anything before? <laughs> or since? It's a one-off, gang. The value system emphasised new ideas of femininity, the woman's role within the home, and the dynamics of work and family. True women, according to this idea, were supposed to possess four cardinal virtues. Any guesses as to the four cardinal virtues that became popular for women to be true women and to be truly domestic creatures in the 1800s? Organisation. Organisation. No, Marie Kondo had not been invented yet. <laughs> Uh, was that virginity is correct absolutely she had to be pure because how otherwise he can't put his pure shag stick into a <laughs> anything other than a first time caller so absolutely integral to the situation any other guesses and 
Fertility. No, I don't think they had a way of tracking that then. So the woman was just blamed as ungodly. God was probably just cursing her. That was, I think, probably implied, but it's not one of the four pillars. Purity, i.e. virginity. Piety. Uh, religion was valued. Unlike intellectual pursuits, it did not take a woman away from her proper sphere, the home, and because it controlled women's longings. I think that means they thought that if you read the Bible, it kills your libido, which is, to be fair, true. Um, <laughs> it's not a sexy book. It's not. <laughs> the only sexy book is The Song of Solomon. It's weird. It's kind of weird man porn. It's sort of like, oh, have you read it? It's not all about, oh, I saw a girl and she had breasts like a coconut. It's awful. Um, <laughs> Submission, true women were required to be submissive and obedient as little children, in quotes, because, yes, I know, a gasp, a gasp from this 2018 audience not having that shit. Uh, uh, Oh, I'm still signing my checks wrongly. Um, (laughs) My feminist checks. Um, because men were regarded as women's superiors by God's appointment. And finally, domesticity. A woman's proper place was in the home and her role as a wife was to create a refuge for her husband and children. A refuge. Cooking needlework, crafting, (laughs) crafting, making beds and tending flowers were considered naturally feminine activities, whereas reading anything other than religious biographies was discouraged. No reading. This is my favourite part now. There's a feminist called... I didn't know her before this. I'm ashamed to say she's now my favourite feminist because her name was Wilma Pearl Mankiller. <laughs> Real name. Her dad was like Chris Mankiller. Um, but I've now decided that all of our feminist names, like if you're going to write a sort of a truly feminist book, if you want a feminist name, you know, like when people say, oh, what's your porn star name? A feminist name should be on this basis of Wilma Pearl Mankiller, it should be your favourite cartoon character, (laughs) your favourite semi-precious tone, (laughs) and the worst thing you would do to bring down the patriarchy. (laughs) So my name is Jasmine Citrine Military Coup. (laughs) Loving it. (laughs) And she... (laughs) She... She pointed out that at this time, women were genuinely thought to have much more delicate nervous systems. And the ideal woman, if you were good at being a woman, in inverted commas, ideally you would be too frail mentally and physically to leave the house. (laughs) Which, to be fair, some days in January, I'm in agreement with that. I feel like I'm too much of a woman to leave the house. But here's the twist, gang, and this is what's really exciting about it. Part of this ideal of the perfect woman and the cult of domesticity was that women were the light of the home, they were called, and they were the moral center of the home. And Mary Wollstonecraft took this idea and said, hold on, if we are the moral center of the home, then we have a moral superiority. So if we're moral inside the house, we're moral outside the house. And therefore, we are the moral center of society. And she used this to begin women's liberation. And this is why, I reckon, if you spend hundreds of years forcing women to sit inside crafting, they will learn to craft your bullshit into (laughs) feminism. I worked out that my feminist name by those rules would be Daffy Sapphire Castration. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. She is also my porn name. Crazy. Has anybody got one? Yes. Oh, I Danger like Jade Strike. Like strike can't be the worst thing you do. I know, I was like, you had me until Strike, and I was like, okay. Danger Jade is great, but a name that starts with Danger can't end with Strike. No. Can't That's end with... A, danger, a, a, as long as it's voted for by a majority of the people involved in the process. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I like, feel we can up that ante. Come on, you must, you'd be happy to do more that. Would you steal to bring down the patriarchy? What? <laughs> If you could bring down the patriarchy, 
patriarchy tonight and all you had to do was steal the golden snitch, you wouldn't do it. What a weird mixed is metaphor. That, is that because... <coughs> golden snitch. The question if, remains, though. <laughs> You would, I don't believe you. If you could bring an end to the patriarchy and you could bring freedom and liberation and equality for everyone everywhere, and all you had to do is go into the House of Parliament and steal some kind of golden snitch. Do you know that when a man recently did it, he still, what's the golden snitch called? The mace. I mean, it didn't do anything, but he kind of waved it around a bit. The one in the House do you of think Commons Harry Potter is government. Uh, I just feel like, I feel like government's a bit of a satire on Harry Potter almost. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, there's lots of standing up and sitting down in Latin, isn't there? You know, <clears throat> the gold, what is there a golden mace doing in there anyway? It's ridiculous. Um, so many good questions. I feel you would. I feel if... I feel if it... Oh, I see. So it's not a moral I thing. I loved that answer. It's it was... your, she said, I'll do the time and I'll lose my profession. Okay, what is your profession? that's what you profession? want for her, Deborah francis Wade. No, it's not, but I'm fascinated. Ooh. And what's your profession? Oh, that's why. Oh, you're a solicitor. Oh. And do you help people in your role as solicitor? Do you do feminist acts? So this is why you can't be the one to commit the crime. <laughs> I see. <gasps> okay. Oh, there's just so some men need, coming in late. You need to... Ah. <laughs> there are some men coming in late. Where have you been, lads? Lads, lads, lads. You've been at the <laughs> toilet. Sorry. It's all right. I'm not the teacher. I accept the apology, but not for the toilet thing. Just a general uh, thing. <laughs> Thank you. It's fine. Thank you. Sorry, soliciting. Okay. No, solicitor. <laughs> so you're solicitor. So that's why. So you'd need to put someone else up to something. So what you'd need to do is, what would you call it? What would you call it in law when you make someone, you ask someone to do a crime for you, but you don't do it? What's that called? Commissioning of an offence of a third party. So you would be Danger Jade commissioning of an offence of a third party. <laughs> this is some strong work, gang. This is some strong, strong work. We're getting there together. Has anyone... We've got to get on, but has anyone got one more? Anyone got one more? Anyone got one that they want to do? Yes? Someone's got one. Someone's got one. Quickly, go on. Aerial Emerald Riot. She sounds like a great time. <laughs> she sounds more like a partier than a patriarchy smasher, to be honest. Is it a party or is it a riot? Exactly. She sounds great. Who's coming tonight? Aerial Riot. <laughs> Boom. Get the vodka. Well, everybody else, feel free to hashtag theirs and then just put feminist name. Because I really want to see them. And at me, at Deborah FW or at Guilt Fem Pod, please. Um, I'd really like to see them. All right. Our guests today, I'm so excited to say, are the writer and lead actor of the play Home I'm Darling, which was a huge hit at the National Theatre and is now transferring to the proper West End. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful Laura Wade and Catherine Parkinson. Now, you'll know Catherine from lots of things off the telly and in the movies and from the BAFTAs. <laughs> You've won a BAFTA, haven't you, Catherine? I was very briefly there, but thanks. I mean, a few years ago for about um, two hours. But, but you, I, you, I, I, I like the way you said that. It's like I present you regularly. You won a BAFTA, though, didn't you? <laughs> I did, yes, yes, yes. That is the most... I did. That is the most... I mean, the thing is, if you brought on a man who'd won a BAFTA, he would have brought it up with him. <laughs> So it'd be like, just pop it down on the table. But a woman comes up, because I was very briefly at the BAFTAs. I was only invited for the two hours that it was on. <laughs> when else could you have been invited? You won a fucking BAFTA. Yeah. And I went to university with Catherine. Yes. Yes, very. We well, met it... at a party, I think, quite a few years ago. And isn't that nice that now we're... Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. Here to go. I thought you were going to say we met at a party at university and tell a story about me that I couldn't remember. <laughs> That's why I froze. I thought you, we saw each other at a party. There's no since. story other than I do remember you referred to your husband and I thought that was the most glamorous thing. And I thought, wow, to have a husband. Because I was only mm. 18 and you were like two years older or something. But I, were... was, I was really young, but I was older than the normal age and I had married to stay in the country. And... <laughs> but... But I'm still with him. That's we so worked together. Glamorous. It wasn't a green card thing. 
we were seeing each other, but we just would have obviously waited until we were older, as our parents would have wished. And um, <laughs> we're still together. It's Tom Selinsky who pops out and tells me I'm going on too long. Um, but I shouldn't ever have said I was married at university because it made me a bit odd. And I think some people thought it was glamorous and some people thought, how can she be married? Because people couldn't conceive of married people then. I remember thinking you were, must be really religious. <laughs> well, well, had been a Jehovah's Witness at one point, but that was all over. But... What, wait, wait, what did you think about Catherine? Oh, Catherine was the coolest of the cool at the university. Yeah, she was. <laughs> she, she, if you're listening at home, she's miming smoking a cigarette, and uh, she was super cool. She was part of Alice a little... Alice was a heavy smoker. I, you which... were just part of this kind of really cool drama gang, and I remember somebody else in the gang telling me that people would, when you guys would turn up at a party, it wasn't you that said this, but somebody else said, when we turn up at a party, people say the party can begin now, they're here. <laughs> it's true. But <laughs> if you're listening at home, uh, Catherine is now miming n- the use of narcotics. Um, as a joke. As a joke. <laughs> But I, somebody did say to me that there was a rumour that I was sort of married in name, but I was very wealthy and I kept young men in rooms <laughs> and I had sort of a number of young lovers, um, which, I mean, I wish that were true. I was very... Do you know, I was quite happy when I found that rumour out, to be honest. I was like, oh, my God, people think I'm more interesting than I very much am. Yeah. Sorry, wait a second. This isn't about domesticity, is it? Do you know when you're like, Oxford Oxford can't be that bad? What the hell? (laughs) It was Oxford. Mm, It was Oxford. Funnily enough, Laura Wade wrote a brilliant play about Oxford called Posh. It did, even though I didn't go there. Nice. Um, You must have visited, because it was quite accurate. Yeah, I mean, my play was about the boys. I feel like I should have written it about the girls now. Well, there's always time. the boys in the rooms. There's always time. It was sort of about the Bullington Club, really, wasn't it? It was a thinly veiled, fictionalised version of, of, yeah. of the club that David Cameron and Boris Johnson were in, where they would burn yes. money in front of poor people and yes. uh, in, just big dinners, th- and throw their in, and yeah, thrashing in restaurant rooms, yeah. throw their privilege around, not Sounds bother like about the, not worry about, about the consequences, the <laughs> like, the, like the scouts. Yeah, I was just a little. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where, you, where, where you, what, your, what your local scout hut was like. Um, but yeah, it's, it divorced. was very much a metaphor for Brexit. It was. It was a sort of brilliantly some time before Brexit happened, which makes me really clever. Mm. <laughs> well, you are really clever, which brings us to your amazing play. So, can you tell us a little bit about Home I'm Darling, <laughs> your brilliant you. play, which was a smash hit at the National uh, with Catherine in the lead and is now going into the West End? Into the proper West End, which is very exciting. Very good. Um, yes, Home I'm Darling is a play about a woman called Judy, who Catherine plays. And uh, it is her dearest wish to be the perfect 1950s housewife. But now. Um, and it opens with her. You think it is in the 50s, the way they're dressed and the way it's set. And then she pulls out a laptop yeah. and you realise it's now. She's yes. in that job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, well, she's been laid off three years ago and she decided instead of getting another job, this is what she wants to do. So what is she drawn to in this life? Well, I think she's sort of retreating from her work life. It's a sort of disenchantment that happens for her that makes her decide that maybe she will stay at home. She's also somebody who enjoys vintage living and she's got quite a forensic brain. She used to work in finance and I think the natural conclusion to living life like that when she's really officious and OCD about it is that she's going to have this hermetically sealed home life where everything's the 50s and she waits on her husband when he gets in. She gives him his slippers, gives him a cocktail and the whole evening is theirs, and yeah. <laughs> Very much like my home life. <laughs> yeah, mine too. It sounds a bit like she's watched a lot of Mad Men and has sort of imagined herself to be Betty Draper, which I have to say, <laughs> I have once or twice thought, the thing is, I don't really want to be Betty Draper, I want to be one of his sort of sexy in town lovers. Yeah, I think she's sort of fast forwarded through the sad bits. Mm. But I think the thing about that show is the visual aspect of it. Somehow, despite them being quite honest about how shitty 
he and the other men around him was, the visual of it is so strong and so arresting mm. that we all went, ooh, mad men. I mean, um, I'm a feminist, kind of a like that. but John Hamm. <laughs> right? Oh. Seriously, you totally, totally would. But the thing is, my problem with it, my problem with it is I fancy him as Don Draper, which isn't right, because he is no, a famous, same, yeah. fictitious misogynist. Mm. Mm. Catherine, why are you making that face? Oh, I, I don't fancy any version of him. Well, if we go out together and we don't bump into David Cameron, but we Hopefully, bump into John Hamm, yes. he's mine, and there'll be no fight. <laughs> that's the deal. I mean, don't hold me back. Don't issue. hold me back. Tom would understand that. Okay, that's he would great. I'm glad we have his full Tom would support. Never, Tom would never want me to miss that opportunity. He would, he would not. <laughs> he, he wouldn't want that for you. I hope we don't... Yeah, we just need if to not confuse David Cameron. If he bumps into the young Diana Rigg... Playing Mrs. Peel. It's less likely, though, isn't it? It is. He's yeah. got my full blessing. Um, what is it, though? Why did you write this play? It feels like a very timely piece, which is about this sort of juxtaposition, this pull between something that was sort of simpler about those yeah. times. I think it's something to do with gender roles being assigned. There is a simplicity to that. I know where to go, I know what to do. I was in a cult when I was younger. People say, what kind of person could join a cult? And I don't think that's the right question. I think the right question is, when in your life would you be most susceptible to join a cult? And I think that sometimes what a cult offers is, if you make this one very big decision to join us, all further decisions will be taken by us. And mm. you can relax. And there's yeah. something about that gender binary that I think is reassuring. And as much as I know if I do this in the morning and this in the afternoon and this in the evening, I'm right. Yeah. Do you think there's something to that? Absolutely. I think one of the attractions of that life for someone like Judy is the clarity of the roles. They don't need to do the constant negotiation of who's doing what and how do we live together, which anybody who lives with a partner or, or even a housemate has to do. But they've got it all worked out. They know exactly what they're each doing. They know exactly what their roles are. And it's all really clear. And it, she, she Judy has actually talks. grown up in a cult, interestingly, and has a very kind of right on hippie mum she had quite a sort of rule free upbringing it wasn't interestingly what you're talking about saying the cult you have rules and so on I think it was a slightly more um, no, everybody was the parents it was a bit kind of free and I think she wants to have her roles sort of specified and know exactly what she's doing but I think also it's a reaction against modern life and, you know, mm. the Instagram generation and the busyness of it. And I think a lot of us now sort of sometimes want to retreat and it's sort of about what happens if you follow that to its very logical, efficient conclusion. Although if I had her house, I would not stop Instagramming it. <laughs> no, it, is it would be it's like an Instagram paradise. I'd so get the, a friend yeah. to do it to pretend that I wasn't on social media. But yeah, because <laughs> the temptation to have that sort of perfect... 50s, early 60s look, vintage look, and not show it off would be too much. Mm -hmm. But the, I do understand that idea of retreating and the idea of the resting place because feminism is a fight. It's a fight for change. And I absolutely understand why somebody might want to lean into the status quo and, in fact, actually go backwards. I'm not saying we should do this. I'm not advocating it. But I understand the appeal of just going... If I just go back and I don't fight it, if I just say, as you say, everything's simple, I'm going to take care of all the cooking and I'm going to take care of yeah. all the cleaning and I'm going to take care of all of these responsibilities and the decorating and the beautifying. Yeah. It's sort of also the flip side of the having it all thing. Judy would say that she's seen through the idea of having it all because actually having it all meant exhausting yourself trying to do everything. And she would say that in order to live in a tidy house, she needs the time to be at home. And um, she talks a lot about cleaning behind things, which is not something I've ever done, even in research for this play. Um, <laughs> I've done a lot. Of that, that makes me physically so. uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, obviously, the notion of it being a reprieve from whatever the opposite of it is, if we're going to call that modern life, also assumes that the person who's doing it has to fit into traditional gender norms. So if they make you uncomfortable, if you're not a like feminine cis woman who already has a husband and can be supported and maybe doesn't have to concern themselves about money, then maybe that's like a reprieve that's allowed for you or permitted, mm. but it wouldn't function for somebody who doesn't fit in. No, I mean, she talks about being a feminist to her mother, Judy, and she says, you know, I've got a choice. And of course, for... Most women, they don't have a financial choice. So I think Laura's play cleverly sort of asks the question, do we have a responsibility to the women before us to 
as she stands there with her feather duster in her 50s thing, looking like this kind of doll. Is that really a feminist choice? Can she legitimately call herself a feminist? When we go out and sort of, um, I say we, as if I've done it, get hugely inflated breasts <laughs> with silicone, which I have yet to do, can that be a feminist choice? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, nowadays we have the privilege to choose. I'm a feminist, so whatever I do is, do we have a responsibility to not be seen to be a product of the patriarchy, to look like something that basically you know, was invented It's by such men. an interesting central premise, that, the idea of... Because we are in an age now where people say, well, if I, it's my choice and I'm a woman, therefore it's feminist. And I argue in my book that that isn't really the case because otherwise there's no point to feminism. If every, every single thing a woman does ever is feminist because a woman's done it, then what's the value in feminism? That's there... individualism as feminism, said a very clever Guardian journalist, and I've been pretending I said that ever since. <laughs> <laughs> it's, really it's really good, you should keep that. Yes. Yeah. An individual woman reaching a certain milestone isn't feminist. I always think of Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who fought tooth and nail and to, to become the first doctor, and she, she got past incredible bigotry, and she actually learned French to go and study in Paris, where they were open to med- women doing medical degrees. Imagine learning French well enough to a medical degree. Who could care that much? But she did. And, but that's not the feminist act. The feminist act was she set up a teaching school to teach other women to be doctors and didn't just go, oh, well, I'm the special woman one now and I'm in the man's club. She insisted that other women have this opportunity after her. And so there are fundamental questions in this play being asked, and I think it's a really enticing play to go and see, to sit there and ask those questions of yourself. But then on the other hand, is there sometimes a snobbery about things that are highly femme? Because they're femme, they're somehow less good? Is that explored in the play? To some extent, yeah. It's all there in the relationship between her and her mother. And her mother is extremely snobbish about some of the... And actually, when you're looking at it in the play and the set, as we've said, is completely beautiful, very Instagrammable. A lot of you sitting there watching it, I think, sort of, why not? Because what's wrong with wanting to live in beautiful surroundings and have everything just so and have everything be tidy and have a a set of stairs that doesn't have a load of crap on it waiting to be taken somewhere, (laughs) either up or down? You just don't know. It could could be either, really. (laughs) I would love Ever. that, but I would love someone else to do it. Yeah, I don't want to give up my job to do it. I want it to just be done. Yeah. Does the play explore how that's a possibility? <laughs> <laughs> Does the play solve my that problem? My husband and I have been using the laundrette since we met 15 years ago. Does, not, does everyone else like, have a... Um... Do you use a laundrette? A, what, a service wash? I think that's really sensible if you can afford it, to just sometimes, you know, just go... We that's the thing. <laughs> we're we're cutting down this year but you know yeah yeah. Yeah. I mean listen this is how the other half live beyond their means Um, but (laughs) but the idea of things being ordered and things being aesthetically pleasing I think sometimes we diminish those because the male genius is always sort of scattered the idea of male genius is papers all over the table I talk about something I call manchevling that if a woman came into a job interview in a dirty tracksuit with holes in it she would get nowhere in any industry but if a man comes in in a filthy mac and pajama bottoms on and mismatched shoes oh he's a genius give him an opera to direct (laughs) if a man doesn't care about aesthetics he's a genius if a woman doesn't care about aesthetics it's probably a sign that she can't cope with anything so I think there is this massive double standard but I also do think that if you do dress like Judy in the play there will be a certain amount of judgment from the world that you're not a proper feminist Mm. And do you think, Catherine, you can be a proper feminist and dress like Judy? Mm. Yes. I mean, as somebody who is a feminist but loves craft, uh, <laughs> um, I, 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 like, I, I like people who like craft. I did mock it, but I mocked the fact I was, that they were being forced to do it. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just pleased Obviously, I said it. that's ridiculous, but we're very happy and supportive of it. Good for you. <laughs> What um, do you craft? I'm, I'm joking, I she don't. Asked. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I mean, I work a bit with clay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I do think, in the particular instance of the play, I think Judy is disenchanted with the gender pay gap at work. She's unhappy, so she retreats. It's a kind of a level of psychological unrest going on there. So I do often find myself asking, is it okay to... When you talk about the Photoshop thing, for instance, I remember a few years ago doing, I don't do many photo shoots at all, but I did something for Woman and Home, and it was in the early days of Photoshop, and 
the photographer said, come and look at this. And I thought, oh, my face looks different because the quite prominent mole that I've since had removed, but there is a scar still there, was gone. And they don't ask your permission. That's what's so odd about it. So it's almost like some stranger has gone... Let's just objectify you, decide what bits I should really get rid of just to make you <laughs> remotely passable in a magazine. So I was both hugely offended by it and also very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> That's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because, you know, in the hashtag Me Too thing, I saw an interview with an actress and she was basically in knickers on the front cover and it said, so-and-so discusses Me Too, you know, and then sort of looking at the... And I just, I can't bear that hypocrisy, but at the same time... We're all quite vulnerable to being that hypocrite. Yeah. It's a, and I it's do a, think it's a hypocrisy. But it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because if you choose to take your clothes off... then I haven't done that, Deborah. <laughs> no, if one chooses to take one's one clothes One play off, many years ago, <laughs> Deep Throat Live on stage, hardly anyone saw it. It was Oxford. <laughs> it was Oxford. I think it's worse if hardly anyone saw it. You don't want a small audience doing deep throat. You want a big audience. Because then it's sort of like just seven old men in Macs. I, I didn't deep throat, but I think a lot of people came expecting me to deep throat. Deep throat. So, yeah. Do you feel, Laura, as a woman working in the theatre, this is a vibrant time for women to be able to write about our own issues and put them out, and they're getting this amazing sort of rightful central platform? I think it's getting better, yeah. This show was on at the Dorfman at the National. They've just invited me back to write another play for them. And they've said I can have a go at doing it on the Olivier, which is massive. And that's, oh. where, the, that's where the men get to do their men plays. So, um, that is amazing. Yeah. That is where the men get to do their men plays. Yeah. Do, they, they, know, know, do they know you're a woman? <laughs> they, 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 <laughs> I think I might have, have mentioned it once. Have they but, met you or do you just sign your emails at L.Wade? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, actually, all the people I know that do the initials thing are actually secret men. <laughs> so, um, are they? They're secret yeah. men pretending to be secret yeah, women, pretending DC to be secret Moore. men. He's well, a guys, man. it's really hard um, to be a man right now. It's so. really tricky. It is, it is really see, difficult. You cannot buy a razor <laughs> <laughs> without being told not to grope women. And that is not fair. You should not be so, distracted yeah. from your uninvited, unsolicited <laughs> groping and leering in the middle of trying to get a clean shave. What yeah, is that? It's, it's really not hard. Necessary. So what are you going to be doing at the National? Do you know yet? I don't know yet. I, um, I, yeah, I, don't, I mean, this one was a play about housework, so I'm all out of ideas, really. Um, <laughs> deep throat. <laughs> <laughs> I, see it, I, I will it finally it do it on the Olivier for you. <laughs> I it's, a a it's a musical, though. It's you the deep throat with an exclamation mark. <laughs> and so, Catherine dancing. So it's so. an exclusive revealed here at The Guilty Feminist. Laura Wade's new play will be on the main stage at the Olivier and it will be deep throat, exclamation mark, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> Starring Catherine Parkinson. <laughs> reviving her fringe role from, uh, I believe, the late 90s. Uh, no, it would have been early 2000s, wouldn't it? Because we graduated in 2000. And you uh, did it I've immediately lied afterwards. I've so much about my age, I can't actually remember how old I am. No. OK, we'll <laughs> no, edit all that out. That's not true. Yeah, we both I'm left 41. university in 2007. <laughs> and we were only 12 at the time. <laughs> that's incredible. I know. And very mm. believable. Um, you were saying before that this is a play that you wrote specifically for Catherine, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. And I was wondering, does that make it more pressurised? I thought of you. Here you go. <laughs> oh, she's a, a very lady flimsy person it? for me. Um, you're perfect for it. No, it's, um, it actually came out of us having worked together before. We did a play together about, God, 12 years ago when we were four. And um, <laughs> as a writer, you get used to some actors kind of fitting your work. And the words I write sound way better coming out of Catherine's mouth so we worked together a few times on little things in between and when I had the idea for this play I just I knew that Catherine was the person that I wanted to play it so we got her involved at a really early sort of workshop stage so that when it came to being an actual play she would feel sort of duty bound to do it nice, nice. excellent I paid Laura a great deal of money to <laughs> write me the play yes. that check bounced actually so. <laughs> Well, 2018. She, yeah. <laughs> Hello, guilty feminists. It is Deborah. 
I am briefly interrupting your podcast listening to let you know that my film, Say My Name, is going to be screened in London on the 22nd of February at Film Fest International. If you would like to find out more, just go to filmfestinternational.com, 10 a.m. in the morning. It's an early one on the 22nd of February. And I think I'm going to be doing a Q&A afterwards, and I will certainly be there to have a selfie with you or sign your book. On the 5th of March, I am going to be hosting the Stylist Remarkable Women Awards. I'm terribly excited about this. So if you go to stylist.co.uk, you can find out more about this. I believe you can nominate women and vote for them. And I will let you know more about this. Keep an eye on my Instagram feed, dfdubs, D-U-B-Z, and also at the Guilty Feminist Instagram feed. We will be touring around the country. I'll be coming around with some of your favorite Guilty Feminist co-hosts doing stand-up comedy and a big live Guilty Feminist tour with everything you love about it in big venues with lots and lots of fun songs, comedy, chat, everything that you love. It's not going to be recorded. It's not going to be a podcast. It's going to be one show that we tour around. And we've already let you know some of the dates. In our second week, we're going to be at Ipswich. Colchester, Richmond, and South End on Sea. That's on the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th of May. There are dates from the 1st of May till the 30th of May all over the country. So check out our website, guiltyfeminist.com or ticketmaster.co.uk to find those dates. Come along, check it out. It's going to be a big, big celebration. Do not miss it. As always, my book is available at Waterstones, Amazon, and in all good bookshops. And if you would prefer that I read it to you because you enjoy the podcast, then it is available on Audible. Back to the podcast. All right. Are you ready for some startup comedy? Yeah. Yeah. Then please welcome to the stage the wonderful Catherine Bohart. Hello. Hello. Are you well? Yeah. Yes, good. I feel like you've seen the worst of me, and I'm not about to help the situation. Um, okay, domesticity. First of all, delighted I can say that word. But secondly, I feel like I don't usually think of myself as very precious about my domestic life until somebody intrudes on it. You know, like you just think you live an average, you're not like possessive about your things, you're normal about your home, sure, absolutely. And then someone comes to stay and you think, <laughs> I'm going to kill you with my bare hands. Um, And that is recently what I experienced because my lovely father, whom I adore, who's my very good friend, came to stay with me for the weekend. And I did. I thought I was going to kill him violently. Not his fault. Uh, It's just that he kept insisting on breathing and chewing uh, (laughs) the whole time. The whole time he was there. I think that's unacceptable. And I don't know if I'm the only person who feels this way, but probably one of my most irrational hatreds was that I probably don't think anything as annoying as my parents relaxing in my home. (sighs) Unacceptable. And not even their fault. I tell them to. They come over and I'm like, come in, make yourselves at home, sit down, relax. And then I think, oh, would you look at you there, sitting. (laughs) Sitting and resting. Like it's your own, it's not your your home. You know what I mean? It's not... It's not your home. It's obviously my rented accommodation. I frequently borrow money from you to pay for. And uh, it's unacceptable. I do, no, I love my parents, to be fair, uh, from a distance. Now, um, I think my domestic life was largely informed by my nationality, which is to say that Irish domesticity, it's largely guest focused. Like, I don't remember a time in my childhood where we weren't cleaning on the suspicion <laughs> that someone might call it. Do you know what I mean? We'd always cook with the sort of hanging spectre of a potential guest. So you also have to make extra despite no cause for concern. Um, and so that's kind of defined my nesting and my home now because it means that I'm now one of those ladies who has like way too many tampons and spare toothbrushes. Uh, I mean, bleeding women don't usually show up at my house unprepared. It's not like... I'm in a relationship, so there's no fear of me needing to give out toothbrushes on a constant basis, which just means I'm now one of those people who, when their housemate has a one-night stand, I'm the person who's like, anyone want a toothbrush? (laughs) Doesn't make it better. Um, (laughs) I'm quite lucky in a way, but also, I suppose, 
abnormal in the sense that my parents very much subverted traditional gender expectations in terms of domestic life in that my dad always did what you might consider to be uh, the women's jobs if you're uh, a misogynist and um, <laughs> so just stuff like he did all the cleaning he always did the big shop and that was very much his role my dad used to do this thing before he'd go to the shop where he would shout up the stairs by the way I have a sister a mom and so there's three women in his house, so he used to shout up the stairs before he'd go to the shop and he'd say, um, I don't know if anybody else's dad did this, he would say, uh, anyone on their period? <laughs> Are you a dad, sir? Uh, no, I've actually profiled, very obviously, I've picked the man beside you, so sorry. Uh, Are you a dad? Yes, thumbs up, great. Uh, doesn't want to speak to me, fair enough. Um, and uh, would you do the same thing? <laughs> so, no? Yeah, yeah. Hideous. Um, <laughs> so sorry, so sorry. <laughs> well, uh, my dad would do this and... Uh, <laughs> It's not as threatening as it sounds, by the way. He was amazing at it. My dad would ask this and he'd be like, oh my God, do, am I? Do I? Like he knew our cycles better than we do, which with three women in the house is actually quite clever of him. But he was on it. But he would go to the shop and he would bring you back tampons, pads, pastries, chocolate, painkillers, and he would make you a cup of tea and a hot water bottle, um, which I think, yeah, I think it makes him a very modern, cool dad, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's nice of you. I mean, not if, like, by the way, I should say, he only did it if you said yes. He wasn't like, pop one up there for good luck, ladies. He did... <laughs> <laughs> he did uh, he did check now uh, my my domestic life at the moment is very much shared with my partner uh, of three years I'm dating a sort of small uh, boy of a girl um, <laughs> tiny masculine uh, bird child and um, I love her with all of my heart but our domestic life is not really defined by prescribed roles in the way I imagine uh, you could say some heterosexual relationships are there's no obvious person who should do x y or z uh, except that I'm the boss so she has to do the boy jobs uh, <laughs> one thing we do have though though I think is also true of heterosexual couples and all couples indeed maybe this is not the case actually it could be just us but we tend to move in quite seasonal cycles uh, which is to say that in the summer um, she's a tiny little human and she doesn't take up much space but I, when I sleep, uh, emit the heat of a thousand suns and so in the summer she can really, when she's mad at me hold a grudge because she doesn't want to touch me anyway so she can really lean into when we go to bed and she's angry with me but in the winter she has to forgive me because <laughs> she fucking needs my body heat and it's a wondrous thing <laughs> it is wonderful one thing we have done, which is when you live with someone for a sufficient amount of time, what you do is start to create patterns and sort of signaling. That means that you don't have to discuss everything, but you're slightly aware of particular habits and patterns in your partner. And in my case, you know, that means like you kind of know without them saying when they're a bit grumpy or if they're hungry or tired or um, sexy, if they're feeling sexy. And my girlfriend, I mean, like I say, I have OCD and she has picked up on this uh, because it's... Uh, a lot and um, she what she'll do when she wants to have sex with me because things change like I mean the things that used to start us at the start of our relationship the reasons we used to have sex have completely become the reasons we no longer have sex which are that like you know when it was night time um, or you'd, you'd been drinking or <laughs> or you were at home and um, <laughs> And those change, that's fine, they change. But now, if she wants to signal that she wants to have sex, what she'll do is tidy. <laughs> she'll clean so that I don't have to, right? It's like her way of kind of saying, it's done, so we can. And, um, and I said this to her once, I was like, it's really sweet that you do that. And she was like, what? I was like, it's very, she didn't realize that I knew. She thought it was like some sort of subconscious reaction of mine to being like, things are clean. And I was like, okay. And you thought that was hot? Okay. Um, but it's mad to me that she didn't know because we live with housemates and they know. <laughs> it's like, oh, Sarah's got the hoover out. Better go out for the night. <laughs> I say the night. It's the afternoon. Um, you've been lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I'm very...
very, very excited to see it. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm really, really excited to see it. And I think this central idea about what places can we go to and still be feminist, or is every choice feminist, or are sometimes are we playing into the hands of the patriarchy? And I also did want to say that the issue of money does come up. Can she afford to do this anymore? Yeah, and that's in the play. She does it because she gets laid off, and then it becomes financially untenable to do mm -hmm. it. So without any spoilers... I don't want people going, oh, I just don't want to watch somebody who's got more money than God lounge <coughs> no, around on a divan. Hasn't, no. um, for four hours, I can see that in any theatre in the West End. Um, <laughs> you, you are exploring fiscal issues as well as domestic issues, as well as gender role play issues. And it is a piece exploring ideas and about the mental state of somebody who would want to do this, who would want to retreat to a previous age and the part in all of us, as you say, that wants to shut off the internet and the world and hide and make a lovely nest for ourselves. But does that hark back to something that is from a time where women were not blessed with the liberation that we have? That is a really interesting space to be for any feminist to just sit in that space and ask those questions. I feel like when we come out, we're going to be having the best conversations. So please, please go along and see it. When does it open? Uh, good question. 26th of January. It's previews. It's previews and opens on the 5th of February then it's in the West End until April the 13th I think well, and then it's touring for three weeks. I'm going to go and see it in previews because I'm going to Australia to do some Guilty Feminists so I will be there very early on so if you're there on the same night as me wave um, oh say hi I'm, a, I'm, I'm super What's so aloof I'm you super approachable no I was just imagining you know, wave I'm, like the stylist cover with me on whatever you think I, <laughs> I was imagining I'm here and you're there do you know what I mean just yeah exactly Keep, bring the stylist cover you don't cover think you'll be on the stage for the play <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed I've invited oh. them onto my stage Is that not how it, are yeah, you suggesting I go and see your play and I'm not invited up well um, <laughs> you have to let something from. out no, I did not. I did not think that. I just, you know what I mean. If you see me, like, you know, obviously come up and say hi. I'm sorry, I spoke. Um, <laughs> Yay, uh, feminism! All right. And is there anything else you would like to tell us about the show? Something we haven't covered, or anything else you would like to plug? It's a really fun show, and it's got loads of dancing in it and lovely dresses. Yeah, Catherine's extremely happy about her dresses, and she should be. So ultimately, the real sell is it's got dancing and dresses. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but yeah. I'm selling my show on 50s yeah. dancing and dresses. Yeah. There's something, there we really is something for everyone. Into... Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about, Catherine? Any other projects you've got coming up that you'd like us to know about? Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll see you at the next BAFTAs, but only for the two hours that it's on. <laughs> um, and Laura, we must look out for your new play at the Olivier. And oh you... God, it'll be ages. I take so long. Like, okay. give me six years. No, <laughs> not quite that long. No, we want to several. see it before then. So I mean, if it's the Olivier, that's a lot more seats. So that's more words, probably. Well, then. <laughs> <laughs> and this is your job, is it? It's your please, yeah. <laughs> please come back and when you've got that play ready, please come back and tell us about it. I will. I'm doing my show called thank you one person is coming great uh hopefully to the show why does everything i say sound sexual this evening the point is i'm doing a show called immaculate at soho theater at the end of february so february 25th through march 2nd uh it's on and there are tickets so please come because otherwise i'll just be a lady in a room people uh, people you. go on and on and on about how brilliant this show is you absolutely must see it and uh please get tickets now for home i'm darling at the duke of york's theater in the west end of london if you are in London or can get to London, come along and see it. I believe Amelia's going to be out at the same time. So you could come to London for the weekend and do a double and come and see all the feminist shows at the same time. You could come, you could see Catherine, you could see Home I'm Darling and you could see Amelia. What a brilliant weekend. So if you don't live in London, come along and do that. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Brass's wife, guest co-host Catherine Bohart and our very special guest, Laura Wade. Parkinson. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Slinsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe, Jacob, Sally and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Yeah. <laughs>
fun. Yeah. I mean, I think I did it with a great deal of economy, and that's what Tom was most pleased about. <laughs> he seemed really happy about that backstage. Yeah. He did. He did. Was he saying, what the fuck is she doing? No, he I would never wondering. say that. He's a very polite man. He said, goodness, this is taking a while. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is code for what the fuck is she doing. He is a very... He's very British. He's very British.